It was an explosion of a film. Scarface. Reinventing the gangster movie as a coke-fueled pop masterpiece. Larger than life in every way. It's operatic, it's outside the box. You can't take your eyes off it. There's something so primal about it. They pull out this chainsaw and I'm like, oh my God, what are we about to see here? Pushing the mob epic to the edge and beyond, a team of movie superstars with careers on the line set out to do it big. Pacino. Al Pacino was a real movie star. De Palma. De Palma's made a lot of great movies, but that was his masterpiece. Oliver Stone. He was like a caged tiger. But along the way, there was almost as much drama behind the camera as in front. And Scarface looked as if it might collapse under the weight of its own ambition. The production costs were skyrocketing. There was a movement to fire Brian. The filmmakers took on the city of Miami but the violence was real. The ratings board. We need to get the damn thing rated. We need an R. The reviewers. The critics basically said that it was the worst film of all time. I thought it would be controversial. Oh, God, we got destroyed. And each other. Oliver Stone. Every day he would say, that they're killing my script. Brian didn't want Oliver at Bailey's again. It got to be that contentious. With so many people gunning to take it down, no one had a clue this film would endure quite the way it did. Scarface is running 24-7 somewhere. That's a phenomenon. Scarface, it's so over-the-top grotesque. People see it and they'll repeat all the lines. Lesson number one. Don't underestimate the other guy's greed. Huh? It was an epic film, and then it just kind of went insane. And it grabs you by the throat, it holds you in place. This is the inside story of Scarface. It was the 1980s, the era of big money, big hair, and big appetites, when a film exploded onto the screen in a barrage of bullets and blood, Scarface. An operatic tale about the rise and fall of an immigrant gangster in drug-fueled Miami. This country, you gotta make the money first. Then when you get the money, you get the power. Then when you get the power, then you get the woman. When Scarface premiered in the winter of 1983, audiences were stunned. All I have in this world is my balls and my word, and I don't break them for no one. Moviegoers walked out of the theater, and reviewers called it trash. The film critics saw a movie that was dangerous. That was dangerous to society. That was dangerous to cinema itself. They hated it. They, they thought it was the worst thing. And there would be this silence in the screening room where people were like, Phew, they're gonna put that out? They thought it was horrible. They thought it was irresponsible. Attacked is too violent. <laughs> too vulgar. What the f difference does it make where I'm from? I'm not all right. I burst, you know? And when I get back there, I'm gonna kick some ass all over that place. Too flashy and flamboyant. Scarface seemed destined to be written off. You need people like me so you can point your fingers and say, that's the bad guy. Over the years, though, the film grew into a kind of cult hit, gaining a whole new generation of fans. Huge. Huge. When I was 12 years old, we'd go to the video store and rent it and watch it at my friend's house because my parents wouldn't allow me to see it. I remember I went to Vegas with Quentin Tarantino, Chris Tucker, and Paul Sorvino, and they did Scarface from the beginning to the end, every single scene, one by one, and did all the dialogue from each scene. I saw it on cable uh, when I was probably a junior in high school. It was hands down my favorite film of all time. Even in my likes in my yearbook, I have Tony Montana. So that's how important the film was to me. I work hard for this. In time, Scarface became a kind of phenomenon embraced by the hip hop generation. A primer for gangster life. A reinvention of crime on film. It had a big, big impact on me. 
Tony was doing it big, the film did it big. And that, I think, made it appeal to a lot of people because it was on such a grand scale. It took the thriller gangster medium and it took it up a full notch. To my mom! Over three decades, Scarface captivated viewers with its charismatic anti-hero, the Cuban refugee, Tony Montana, on his one-way trip to the top and beyond. Me, I want what's coming to me. Oh, well, what's coming to you, Tony? The world, Chico. And everything in it. Uh, Al Pacino's performance is enormous. Pacino and Scarface, volcanic. Al is outside the box. With the exception of maybe Jack Nicholson in The Shining, there are very few performances that achieve that level of avant-garde, larger-than-life magnificence. He seemed almost like a, a renegade in all of this, which was an attractive thing in his character to play. You think you can take me? You need a f***ing army, you're gonna take me! Tony's story, the dark side of the American dream. A classic tale of rags to riches to ruin. Tony Montana was a guy just fresh off the boat. He was gonna get his. He didn't care. They, they didn't expect to live too long, so he was just gonna live on the on the edge. It was hot. It was tense, and it was unafraid to make the heroes really despicable. He's ballsy, real real cocky, you know. He was an evil scumbag who killed everything around him. You can begin from nothing, and by making money, you can make something of yourself. That's, that's the good side of it. The tragic part is that you can overreach. When you become excessively greedy, it causes your downfall. Along for the ride on Scarface, a gallery of gangsters and memorable supporting characters. Best friend, Manny Ribera. Very disgusting. The elusively beautiful, Elvira Hancock. Frank Lopez, the boss. Don't underestimate the other guy's green. <laughs> Tony's little sister, Gina. A girl who just wants to have fun. And a handful of vividly drawn thugs and gunmen. With a series of classic images and catchphrases, Scarface became a part of pop culture. Manny, look at this pelican player. You want a job, Willie? Say hello to my little friend! An ode to the shimmering decadence of the 1980s. It's a big movie in every way. And it's excessive. It's loud, it's obnoxious, it's rude. Well, that's what's so great about it. One of the adjectives that you hear most often applied to Scarface is operatic. Operatic is a classy way of saying that it's just so incredibly hyperbolic and over the top that you end up shaking your head going, oh, this could never have possibly happened. It's messy, modern, over the top. But its themes were timeless. Ambition, pride, lust. Who put this thing together? Me, that's who. Who do I trust? Me. A man who rises high and is brought low. It's Shakespearean, it's biblical, it's literary, it's philosophical. It's all these things at once because it speaks to, I think, the human condition. Tony Montana wasn't the only one with ambitions. For its creators, a trio of Hollywood stars, this was a film with high stakes. Screen supernova Al Pacino, hotshot writer Oliver Stone, and daring director Brian De Palma. Each was at a career crossroads, and each had a lot riding on this movie as they struggled to deliver a blockbuster. Pacino was in search of a hit after a string of flops and misfires. Stone was trying to propel his career to the next level, trying to show he could be more than just a writer. De Palma was attempting to make a really big-budget Hollywood film for the very first time. No wonder that behind the scenes, the making of Scarface would have its own tensions, its own battles. Let's just say that at every conceivable turn, Scarface was a prickly and difficult enterprise. 
as the budget skyrocketed and the schedule went haywire. There was a lot of chaos on that set, and De Palma has talked about it as being a really difficult, difficult experience. Even the executives started getting truly nervous. And they're going like, why haven't you shut that thing down? Why don't you get rid of him? Why don't you get a real director? Add in a storm of protest from the Cuban community, howls of outrage from Hollywood itself, and a clash with the MPAA ratings board that endangered its release. At every twist and turn in the narrative saga of Scarface, there was an opportunity for a car crash, and we never missed that opportunity. To create a modern-day gangster classic, this team was about to face on and offset turmoil they never expected. It would be a battle they never saw coming. This is the inside story of Scarface. Do you want to go on with me? To say it. You don't. Then you make a move. It was the early 1980s, and Al Pacino, a major Hollywood star, was suddenly and unexpectedly at a tipping point in his career. As a New York character actor, he had shot to stardom with leading roles in the first two installments in the Godfather saga. Pacino was renowned, even revered, after five Oscar nominations in seven years. I consider Pacino one of the, the greatest living American actors. He was considered one of the you know, greatest actors of his generation after uh, the Godfather films and Serpico and Dog Day Afternoon. But as the 1980s dawned, Pacino had chosen a string of lesser projects, Cruising, Author Author, Bobby Deerfield, and gotten slammed. Cruising, in which he plays a cop that goes you know, undercover in the, the gay leather world, the film was just reviled. Then he goes and makes a film called Author Author. It's very sappy and sentimental, and that film didn't do particularly well either. I don't think Al Pacino fans knew what to make of it. With his career on the line, Pacino and his manager friend and producer, Martin Bregman, were looking for a new role, a big role, to shoot him back to the top. Marty Bregman is very responsible for Al's career. Bregman and Pacino were really sort of father-son kind of uh, a relationship. It was around this time that Al Pacino wandered into an art house on Sunset Boulevard and saw a remarkable film. Marty told me one day that he got a call from Al Pacino and uh, Al said he had just seen uh, Scarface uh, at the Tiffany Theater in Hollywood and he suggested that we take a look at it because he thought it might be a great movie to remake. And this is it. The 1932 classic, Scarface, was the gold standard of gangster films, tracing the rise and fall of mobster Tony Camonte, based on Al Capone. Scarface was one of the defining movies about the Prohibition era. Now listen, you. What kind of mug you think I am? I don't know nothing. I don't see nothing. I don't hear nothing. It boasted a remarkable team, from star Paul Muni, in a riveting, intense performance to the legendary writer Ben Hecht and director Howard Hawks. The original 1932 Scarface is impeccably done from start to finish. I think it is absolutely brutal and frank and lyrical and amazing. Best of all, Universal Pictures had just purchased the rights to Scarface from the Howard Hughes estate. Hughes estate had the five films that Mr. Hughes owned personally on the block and I reached out and bought them on behalf of Universal. Bregman and Pacino told the Universal execs of their interest. I went back to New York and Marty and I went up to his office late one night and we looked at the movie and it was really electrifying. All I had to do was say, you know, Bregman and Pacino uh, want to do a, a remake and uh, the next thing we knew, we were in business on, uh, on remaking Scarface. To get things rolling, Bregman turned to a director with a background in radical film and theater, auteur and provocateur, Brian De Palma. Brian De Palma, he was known for making these huge Baroque films, these very kind of pulpy, but very fun, very stylish, very over the top thrillers. De Palma at that point was really known as a master of suspense. He'd had Dress to Kill, Obsession, and then, of course, Carrie, which is still a huge movie for teenagers, I think. People either loved him or made fun of him because he paid homage or copied 
Hitchcock so much. De Palma and playwright David Raid set down to work, but after months, they couldn't agree on a focus and both left the project. Undeterred, Bregman took the concept to Oliver Stone. Oliver was uh, in the same place Francis Coppola had been just before Godfather. He was a hot screenwriter, maybe one of the top 10, maybe in the top five. Stone had won an Oscar for writing Midnight Express, but what he really wanted to do was direct. His one attempt, the horror film The Hand, had bombed. And at the time, he couldn't get anyone to make his two other scripts, Platoon and Born on the Fourth of July. As for Scarface, Stone had no interest. He said he wanted to do Scarface. I said, I'm not really interested in remakes. When Stone was first presented with the idea of Scarface, he said, you know, I don't really want to do this. You know, there's too many, uh, you know, Italian gangster movies. But Bregman got Stone's attention with his choice of director. Sidney Lumet, three-time Oscar winner. Sid knew Marty, Sid knew Al, they'd done Dog Day, there was a long history. Lumet had an idea, a brainstorm that would change the entire direction of Scarface. What if they updated the story from Prohibition Chicago to modern day Miami and set Scarface against the cocaine wars? Their main character would be a Mario Lito, a Cuban refugee. 135,000 of them had recently arrived, and many of them had criminal records. You ever been in jail, Tony? Me? Jail? No way. We had Mariel, which was 135,000 human beings, supposedly 40% out of jails and insane asylums, that were dumped into Miami over a 90-day period. Crime shot up. It was a disaster. When the boat people came in, uh, the Cubans all of a sudden had, uh, had soldiers. They had soldiers that they could put on the street. It was not unusual for somebody would walk into a mall and shoot up a bunch of people having lunch. For someone who wanted to live in a, in a nice, quiet American community, Miami was not the place. Oliver Stone plunged into this dangerous city to research the story like a journalist. He flew down to Miami to investigate the world of the cocaine cowboys. Oliver Stone really did a lot of investigative reporting. Um, he talked to a lot of DEA agents. Kind of soaked up the atmosphere, learned all the gruesome details of everything that was going on. I was uh, assigned to the organized crime division. Mr. Oliver Stone wanted to come and visit where drug dealers hang around. Stone wanted to see the backstreet world of the dealers and the users. As it turned out, he had a way in. Stone has made no secret to that. Uh, he had dabbled in cocaine. He was perceived as safe by some of the uh, people who were on the illegal side of this because he was willing to buy small amounts of cocaine to kind of keep the conversation going. Soon, Miami dealers welcomed him into their homes and mansions. Frank Lopez, Tony Montana. Hey, but after all that research, Stone had a problem. He had become more and more caught up in cocaine and needed to change something fast. To escape a growing addiction, he decided to head to Paris. Stone said that cocaine was kicking his ass and he wanted to kind of clear his head, but he needed to get away. He needed to separate himself from the whole scene. 8,000 miles from Hollywood, 5,000 miles from Miami, Stone pulled out the DEA case files and created his Mayorlito, Tony Montana, a man with a shady past, moving up through the world of the Cuban mafia. Ruthless, ambitious, street smart, ready to grab the world with both hands and run over anyone who gets in his way. We gotta expand. What's it call him? One tough son of a bitch, you know. Watch your step. His mother hated him. He killed his own best friend. He, he destroyed his, his love life. This is a man who doesn't take no for an answer. This is a man who was born into nothing. And he comes to America and he, and he sees what he wants and he, he reaches out and he grabs it. Stone's storyline borrowed heavily from the original. Themes, plot points, even dialogue. That's Poppy. I don't want to see her tonight. I'll tell her you ain't here. You must be Elvira. She 
Come out after we left the club, you know. I, I tell her you're not here, okay? On the first reading of the script, I, I realized how Oliver had captured that world and uh, made it his own and, and, and brought out that uh, the wonderful uh, texture and nuance and, uh, and power. But when Stone delivered the script to Sidney Lumet, the director wasn't thrilled. Lumet thought it was too cliched, too lurid. So it wasn't entirely comfortable with the way this was going. Lumet uh, didn't feel it was political enough. He wanted a more politically oriented script. Lumet, he was very much a liberal and wanted to work in the idea that the Reagan era politics had allowed for the drug trade to thrive. Bregman was much more kind of conservative guy. This sent off bells in his head. Politics is the kiss of death in big commercial movies. No. Lumet dropped out and the film was hanging in the balance. To save the project, Bregman asked Brian De Palma to jump back in, to bring his eccentric vision to a big screen epic. Scarface was a very different kind of movie for him. It was gonna be big, big budget, uh, not some you know, quirky, weird film made by a New York filmmaker, but a real Hollywood movie with big, big stars. Brian, by the time he was making Scarface, had really developed his cinematic language, and I knew that there would be a lot of risk-taking in terms of how he interpreted a scene, and that the degree of difficulty of some of the shots would be, you know, exciting. Bregman was thrilled. The studio, not so much. From the minute Brian signed on, there was always the worry that uh, Brian would be become eccentric or narrow or arty. And with casting just about to start, everyone was a little nervous. My head of distribution, oh God, threw the script across his desk and he said, you'll get fired. Why not? You got nothing on me. You know it, I know it. After months of working to develop a script for Scarface, it was finally time to begin the audition process. But right from the start, the producers struggled with the casting, trying to decide between established stars and unknown actors. There were a lot of egos involved in the casting of Scarface. I mean, Pacino had a certain muscle. He definitely had a say in this. Besides Pacino himself, the key role to cast was Tony's friend and sidekick, Manny Ribera, a Cuban Casanova with a quick trigger. De Palma's first choice was John Travolta. The two had just worked together on Blowout. And if the star could be an Italian-American, why not the co-star? But then an actual Cuban walked in the door. We're gonna be out of this place in 30 days. Not only that, but we got a green card and a job in Miami, man. Esteban Ernesto Echevarria Sampson, better known as Steve Bauer. Born in Havana, he had taken on his grandfather's last name in Hollywood in order to seem less ethnic. Now, he was a young actor on the rise, appearing in a handful of TV shows, One Day at a Time, The Rockford Files, Hill Street Blues. Brian De Palma thought he might be just right for the role. Brian De Palma saying, hmm, yeah, you're, yeah, I see it. I definitely see it. Are you really Cuban? You, you could prove that, right? I said, yeah, he goes, because we'd like to get a real Cuban actor. And I said, yeah, and I, I can do it. I am, I'm absolutely Cuban. Producer Marty Bregman also liked Bauer. Marty Bregman looked right at me and he said, kid, you're going to do this movie. I guarantee you. I guarantee? Like, I haven't auditioned yet. <laughs> Bregman's guarantee wasn't enough. Bauer still had to audition for Pacino and the studio execs, all voicing different opinions on who should play the role. My agents go, you're not gonna get Scarface. You're deluding yourself. Everybody knows when dust settles, it'll be John Travolta or Eric Roberts. There's no reason why they would cast a nobody, you know? But when the dust did settle, it was Bauer who got the part. We're not the only dopers living on the block, okay? Remember that. The process was no easier when it came to the role of Elvira Hancock, the ice-cold beauty who embodies Tony's American dream. 
Bregman wanted a lot of kind of big name stars or at least actresses whose careers are sort of on the rise. There was everybody from Carrie Fisher to Sharon Stone mentioned. Pacino was really pushing for Glenn Close to, to take the role. But the studio wanted a 24-year-old whose biggest roles had been in Grease 2 and Charlie Chan and the Curse of the Dragon Queen. Michelle Pfeiffer, she was a virtual unknown. We thought she could be a star. When Michelle Pfeiffer was uh, screen tested, people were kind of mixed. They didn't know she could sustain the role, if she could really hold the screen against Pacino. Bregman said he would see her, but she needed to pay her own way from New York to LA for the screen test. He wanted to see how hungry she was. It was a long and difficult process for her, and she fought her way into the movie. What Michelle had was, again, this incredible instinctive intelligence also, you know, that allowed her to, to go there, to go to that, that very, very dark and very fragile person that, that Elvira is. A 24-year-old unknown was up for the role of Gina Montana, a lovely young party girl who falls under her brother's shadow. Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio had no film credits, but Bregman thought she was perfect for the part. And so did Steve Bauer. You happen to be the best thing in his life. The reason that I knew she would be chosen is because besides being like so fresh and beautiful, physically beautiful, um, she had this uh, quality of, of openness, naturally affectionate and loving, you know, and, uh, and so innocent. Gina represents purity. And this is something that Tony Montana, who's, who's tainted from, from the moment we lay eyes on him, uh, desperately wants in his life. He wants something pure. But not all the filmmakers were in sync about that relationship. I was present at a, at a meeting. There was a point of contention with the, the sister relationship. Al really felt strongly about his point of view, which was there was nothing weird about it. He was protective and possessive, so nothing incestual. Nothing is just I never thought I'd see you again, you know? All right, you think they're gonna keep a guy like me down? Well, no. <laughs> but both Oliver and Brian had like, they're like, I think it should be there. It's part of the weirdness of your character. And he was like, no, it's, no, it's not there. It's not there, and, that, and he, that's how it ended up. You're my blood. I don't know. As the rest of the cast was rounded up, the auditions were long and grueling. There were six actors for every part, so you got to perform it with six different actors. I auditioned for it six different times, including going to New York to go audition with Al. For the New York sessions, the producers rented the theater of actress Miriam Cologne, the Puerto Rican traveling theater in Times Square, without realizing she was up for the part of Tony's mother. I said, where, where is she going to be? They said, 304, where's 47? I Oh, they rented my theater. What are you saying? That's your son! Son! I wish I had one. Other key roles included Miami drug lord Frank Lopez, Tony's mentor, boss, and eventual competitor. You stay loyal in this business. You're going to move up. You're going to move up fast. Robert Loja was called in, a veteran character actor who had just finished playing Richard Gere's father in An Officer and a Gentleman. Other established actors rounded out the cast. F. Murray Abraham, Pepe Serna, Gino Silva. The supporting cast that they put together was really incredible. I've been uh, acting for 50 years now, and I've had some, some success. But the film that I'm most remembered for is Scarface. So many of these uh, characterizations in this film, even for one scene, are completely memorable performances. All right, big man, you want to make some big bucks. Now, let's see how tough you are. Brian just looked up at us and just said, what a troop, what a troop. With the casting complete, preparations could begin. Pacino, with his clout and his stage background, demanded that weeks of rehearsal be built into the schedule to prepare, theater style. Al and Brian insist on doing a rehearsal of the whole film as a play. They would block out the scenes. They would put tape on the floor and show us where, basically what the rooms, you know, what the locations were like. And then we'd walk through it, like with our scripts in hand and rehearse it like a play. We did like two and a half weeks of that. 
And we were all like, we could take this on the road. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is like ready to open on Broadway. And that was, I think, a big contribution to the success of the film because there's a real cohesion. Meanwhile, Pacino was building his character. He believed that one key to creating Tony Montana was the accent. So what do you call yourself? Antonio Montana. And you? What you call yourself? After working with a dialect coach, he spent as much time as he could with Cubans to get the right sounds. He will ask you a question. How do you say this? Uh, let, me, let me hear it one more time. To some, the accent was a caricature. I told you to tell him he was in a sanitary, <laughs> not sanitation. But Pacino was dead serious about capturing the Cuban-American sound. It's my dad's accent that I was working with Al on. I, I tried to convey that as much as possible for our, us, the way that we speak. You know, the way that Cubans would speak when they know a little bit of English, you know, and they're just basically getting along, you know. I think Brian De Palma was going to take a, a larger-than-life approach to this film. And I was trying more not to be as authentic, but if I could take the accent and the mannerisms and and sort of just heighten them in a way. I think that was uh, incorporated into my interpretation. The accent, it plays a little over the top, but you know, you, you needed that for that movie. This is Paris, I'm telling you. While Pacino labored over his character, De Palma and his crew were prepping the complicated camera moves and intricate action scenes that are the hallmarks of a De Palma film. If you think of directing this in cinema as, as a language, he was, the kind of director that would not choose the easy vocabulary. You know, he would use big words. Brian, he loves to move the camera and make it mean something. And he's very operatic in that sense. I want that here. I want him here now. Every scene, every sequence was storyboarded out. Well, there's no question that Brian is a student of Hitchcock. And if you know anything about Hitchcock, you know that the entire film was planned out before they got to the set, before, you know, a foot of film was exposed. He always does storyboards, which are kind of like little stick figures. Just literally stick objects. And it gave all the camera angles exactly what he was looking at. Once you understand the code, <laughs> um, you can figure it out. And uh, he pretty much sticks to the, to the storyboards. Together with De Palma, ace cinematographer John Alonzo of Chinatown fame, and production designer Ferdinando Scafiati established the now iconic Miami color palette of pastel and neon a year before Miami Vice. But as key decisions were being finalized and the production prepared to roll cameras in Miami, the filmmakers were unaware of one key fact. They were about to be run out of town. I heard that someone got uh... Uh, Pacino's private number and called him and said, if you make this film, you're going to have problems. Man, we're just staying loose up here, okay? Miami Beach, man. Miami Beach, man. Principal photography on Scarface was scheduled to begin in November of 1982. And the team was impatient to get started with the filming in Miami. But despite weeks of meticulous planning, they had no idea of the problems they would encounter there. Everyone knew Miami had an edge. The city was awash in cocaine. Miami in the early 80s was pretty drug infested. The violence was real. It was a scary time. What the filmmakers hadn't counted on was opposition from the city itself. When the local Cuban community heard that a film about a Cuban refugee drug lord was in the works, they began to protest. That's when things really went off the rails with the city commission. One man made it his mission to shut Scarface down, Commissioner Demetrio Perez Jr. The reaction of the community was of indignation uh, because uh, they tried to present the Cuban American community associated to the drugs uh, dealers, to the criminal activity. There were negotiations going on between the production company and the city about where they could film in, in, you know, in city locations where they needed permits, etc. And, and Perez began making a lot of threats about the, he would withhold his consent. The guy went like, that's just great that the first movie that deals with Cubans in America has to be about criminals. That's not fair, blah, 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 blah. Nobody could shut him up. Perez was adamant, and other factions in Miami were prepared to take things further still. 
there was uh, concerns that uh, people might uh, take some kind of hostile action against uh, the company or Al Pacino himself. I wound up carrying a, a sidearm down there because the police told me to. Uh, we had threats and it, it really got serious. And uh, I heard that someone got uh, uh, Pacino's private number and called him and said, if you make this film, you're going to have problems. I think that was kind of the beginning of the end. They, they basically, I think, they figured it was just going to be too much of a hassle to, to make Scarface in Miami. They packed up the entire production and moved it back to California. It would be just the first of many issues to push the film off schedule and over budget. Back in Los Angeles, the filmmakers scrambled to replace Miami with West Coast locations. Cinematographer John Alonzo and production designer Ferdinando Scarfiati had their hands full. Fernando Scarfiati, he had the hardest job because we switched everything from Miami back to LA. He came up with brilliant ideas. The posh mansion where Tony gets married wasn't in Coral Gables, but Santa Barbara, a home once owned by novelist Thomas Mann. The Bolivian drug lord's estate was in Montecito. And Montana Travel and Montana Management Company were actually on Sunset Boulevard. The locations weren't the only thing holding up the schedule. With the first day of the shoot fast approaching, the production team was juggling several crises, but one loomed largest. We were about to start uh, shooting on Scarface, and there was a bit of 11th hour drama. I remember when I first come on the movie, the, the, the whole debate was not, it wasn't the movie, it wasn't the story, it was the scar. They had makeup people coming in, and they were doing all these scars, all these film tests on, on Al. It was all about the scar. Pacino liked having the scar cross his eye. He came up with his own backstory about a knife fight. I felt this character was good with a knife and had, had fought with a knife. And I thought it would be interesting if it got through the eyebrow and the action pulled my head away and it went down even further into this part of the face. So there's one up here and here. But none of the test scars worked. It was the Thursday before the Monday we were starting to shoot, and we still did not have a scar applied prosthetic that looked anyway realistic. In a movie called Scarface, that was a problem. So basically on the Friday before the Monday we started shooting, the, the makeup artist was changed, and we did an emergency 11th hour makeup test Friday afternoon, it really went right down to the wire with the scar. Finally, scar in place, the first scene of the movie began shooting in November of 1982. Tony's arrival and interrogation. Been in a mental hospital? Oh yeah, and they both coming over. In a way, it was a microcosm of the entire film. We did many, many, many takes that day. We shot 15,000 feet of film. Now that's almost three hours of film. I think that everyone was just so hyped up to get going. As Tony Montana was introduced in a series of close-ups, Al Pacino served notice that he was about to throw himself into one of the bravura performances in American film. Flashy, some would even say hammy, but absolutely fearless. He didn't just chew the scenery, he demolished it. Al immerses himself in character in a way that's uncanny and sometimes terrifying. It was amazing how Al Pacino stayed in character all the time, day and night. Always talking like Tony Montana, man. Al Pacino comes prepared and he's focused. And you know who that character is and as soon as he comes out of his trailer. De Palma, too, was serving notice of his stylistic intentions. With a flashy 360 move, the camera circles Tony, always focused on his face, never on the other actors. Brian already had that, that reputation of moving the camera ever so slowly, so it's always in motion, you know, and, uh, and you're brought into the world of the character. From the start, there was no question, Pacino and De Palma were intent on building something special. 
it was clear that Al Pacino and, uh, and Brian had a very, very unique bond going, and they worked very, very closely together. Brian trusts his actors. He casts them, works with them, and then lets them go. I think it's probably part of the reason why the movie was so good. After the initial setbacks, the production was finally going full speed. But a scare about the star would give everyone a nasty shock. A bodyguard or something grabbed Al out from under the chair and said, call an ambulance, he's been hurt. And his face was all bloody. You tell Frank, I'm keeping this guy on ice for him. <laughs> it was the end of 1982. And as Scarface entered its first week of shooting, Director Brian De Palma was grappling with the details of how to film this ultra-violent movie. His plan was high energy and high risk. A virtuoso style, jammed with intricate camera moves and dangerous stunt work. Tony Montana's story gets underway in the refugee camps of Little Havana as a sweeping crane shot swoops down into the Mariel refugees. To get out, Tony will have to commit a murder. You tell your guys in Miami, your friend, it'd be a pleasure. I kill a communist for fun, but for a green card, I'm gonna carve him up real nice. Tony slashes his way out of the camps and into a better world. But as Tony makes his way up the ladder, director De Palma kept amping up the violence. When he meets a Bolivian drug lord, he's treated to the killing of a supposed snitch. A jaw-dropping demonstration. I only fell about four feet uh, into a cushion, and it was clear it wouldn't hurt me. But when they put that rope on me, I was really, I got really scared. And uh, I told them, let's, let's shoot this first one, because I'll never be as frightened as I am right now. It was a mid-air execution, 400 feet up. We get up to Santa Barbara and they throw me out of the helicopter. I hit the end of the cable so hard it almost pulled the helicopter out of the sky. You can't just let the full body weight come to the end of the rope. So we developed a ratchet, and a ratchet means that you have bungee cord wrapped around it. That was the first time anything like that had ever been done. Never been done. People weren't even doing bungee jumps in those days off bridges, so it was kind of an exciting, very frightening thing. I had black and blue marks everywhere. I'm going, I will never do that again as long as I live. Well, we get back to the screening room, and I'm sitting next to the palm, and he's going, something's not right here, something's not right. I said, what? It looks brilliant, you know? The next morning, I get a call from the palm of bright and early. He says, I figured out what's wrong. His hands were not tied behind his back. Luke Stroller calls, hey, Dick, what are you doing? I'm going, uh, nothing, what are you doing? He said, uh, Brian wants you to do it again. He goes, what? I'm going, I don't I won't use the proper words, but I said, that, no, no. And I'll never do that again. I said, yeah, we got to throw you out of the helicopter again. And he said, why? And I said, because you want to tie your hands. And this time we're going to do it at Universal Studios over the pond there. And we're only up about three or 400 feet. So if I, the rope broke or anything, I'd still get killed, but they could find the pieces. And every time I see it, uh, there's, there's a difference. Absolutely in the top 10 of the stunts I've ever done in my whole life. Uh, as far as Fear Factor, probably in the top one or two. Seriously. <laughs> as the filming went on, De Palma would up the difficulty factor even further. In the scene where Tony, now a newly minted kingpin, enters the decadent world of the Babylon nightclub and gets attacked. It was a tough shot, from the glittering set dressing of the Babylon to the thousands of reflections in the club's funhouse mirrors that explode in the vicious attack. 
the Babylon Club was a set that uh, just tr took a tremendous amount of time. The mirrors, it was a real problem. You're looking almost 360 degrees, so where do you have the cameras, where do you have the lighting, where do you, how do you pick up the action? Obviously that is a cameraman's nightmare because you have the reflection, you know, if you don't shoot it just right, you'll actually end up seeing, you know, the cameraman or God forbid the director behind the camera or something. We had the section of the mirrors behind the heads and they were built on pivots so that if the camera is behind it, so you don't see the camera in it, we would angle the, the mirrors. It was brilliantly thought out. And then they had to blow it all up, which was even harder. Well, you've got an actor sitting in the front of real mirrors, and that's very dangerous. You can't really ever put a squib behind real glass because it's gonna shoot shards of glass out. And the only way to really make them work was to shoot uh, wax plugs at the mirrors. It wouldn't kill a person to get hit with one of those, but it would really ruin your day. Pacino had to look as if he took a shot to the arm, but ducked quickly out of the way so he wouldn't be injured by the wax bullets. Al's sitting in his booth, and, uh, and the deal is they're gonna shoot him and he's gonna take some hits. We rehearsed it to the point where it was almost like a choreograph, like a dance in a way. We blew everything off the table, and then boom, he's down below, cut, right? Like a bodyguard or something grabbed Al out from under the chair and said, call an ambulance, he's been hurt. And his face was all bloody. Steve says, well, Al's been hit. And uh, I go, I went right into his dressing room, which normally you, you don't do. And he opened the door and says, Ken, that was wonderful. Well, he had gotten blood on his hand. So when he went and wiped his nose, he put blood on his nose. Well, that was that studio blood. It was a false alarm, but it pointed to a real problem. Wrangling each one of these elaborate scenes took time and multiple takes for cast and crew alike. Pacino and De Palma, two perfectionists, worked hard to get the perfect shot the perfect performance, no matter how long it took. We do like 20 takes, sometimes because I would say, let me just, let me just try another version of that. And we'd end up doing 25 takes of the same setup. Ron De Palma did more takes than any director I've ever worked with on film. We'd be into the 16th, 18th, 20th, 30th take, because that's the way he liked to do it. I said to Brian, Mr. De Palma, how many times do I have to die? More takes meant more expense, and reports of the overages began to filter back to the studio. So halfway through the shoot, I knew we were gonna have a giant problem on length. Each day raised new issues on set. I got a phone call very early in the morning. Al won't come out of his trailer. How long has this been going on? A little over an hour. Tom was getting upset with the amount of money we were going over and the amount of time. Every hour is about $60,000 to $70,000 an hour, something like that. He's saying, when I get up there, I'm gonna tell Pacino this, and I'm gonna tell Pacino that. Go to Santa Barbara. Now Al's been in his trailer for two and a half, three hours. Go knock on the door. Hey, Al, it's Tom. No answer. Then I realize I'm banging on the door and talking to the wrong person. I wait a few minutes, I go back, I bang on the door and go, yo, Tony, what the f you doing? And she goes, huh? I go, Tony, it's Tom. Man, I gotta talk to you. It's important. Come on. Door opens. The crew is like, oh my God, thank God. People are running and jumping and stuff. And go to work. The next time I saw Pacino, I said, hey, Al, how did it go with Tom Mount? He said, he's the nicest guy in the world. Just another day. But on the lot, an even bigger issue was beginning to arise a growing tension between the writer and director. Oliver Stone was a real up-and-coming guy who saw himself as the hotshot director that he would indeed become in a couple of years, uh, trying to flex his muscle. He was not shy. Oliver Stone was browbeating Brian De Palma to let him come to dailies. Oliver's talking through the whole screening, and uh, Brian's getting more and more ticked off. And we got into this whole screaming match that Brian didn't want Oliver at Daly's again. Oliver Stone wanted to protect the vision of his script, and he was upset that De Palma was cutting dialogue and scenes he loved 
to include more elaborate camera shots. Oliver Stone was very, very passionate about it. And because he was a, a filmmaker himself, he felt strongly about each, each page and each scene. The guy just won an Academy Award and he was feeling his oats. But more importantly than that, he cared about the damn thing. There was a lot of tension about that because Oliver, he wanted to be the director. And the attitude was Marty Bregman and said, listen, we pay you for the script, you know, let it go. It's not yours anymore. Oliver Stone had imagined Scarface as a gritty, realistic view of crime in the streets, like Pacino's Serpico or Dog Day Afternoon. Now it seemed to be turning into a high-gloss cartoon. It was becoming more and more operatic and less and less a grounded reality movie. Oliver Stone felt that the dramatic arc that he had built into the script was different from De Palma's and that they were kind of losing uh, the kind of story that, that Stone wanted to tell. Because of budget, because of just logistics, there were scenes that had to be cut. That was kind of a blow to him already. He felt like, wow, man, no, no respect, you know. <sighs> How could they do this, you know, to the story? Stone wrote a five-page memo of his concerns and sent it off to everyone from the studio executives to Al Pacino. Oliver Stone, every day he would say, they, they cut out my whole whatever scene, they, they got rid of the cigarette boat scenes, they, they're killing my script. Then he would come to the set like with the manuscript, <laughs> you know, and he would be like, Steve, 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 come here. Have you shot so this scene yet? And I'd be like, no. And he goes, when are you gonna shoot? And I go, I think they're dropping that scene. And he'd be like, oh. and He was like a, a, a caged tiger, man. I could see he wanted to be directing this. Finally, he was banned from the set, basically. They, they just said, please don't, please don't come around. It got to be that contentious. From the writer, to the director, to the studio execs, the tension on the set was just beginning to escalate. And they're going like, why haven't you shut that thing down? Why don't you get rid of him? Why don't you get a real director? And one unforgettable scene was about to take the shoot to the breaking point. No, don't kill me, please. I won't kill you. Oh, Christ, thank you. Manon, no, you that piece of... One month into the Scarface shoot, the tension was building. It didn't help that the set pieces got trickier and trickier as the filming rolled on. One scene in particular would push boundaries of movie making. The scene that would come to define the film, the infamous Chainsaw Massacre. When Tony and his crew get sent to make an exchange with a Colombian drug dealer, things get a little nasty. Watch what happens to your friend. At the time, it was the bloodiest, goriest scene ever shot in the history of Hollywood. As soon as that scene starts, you know something very bad is going to happen. And just when you think it's going to happen, the camera wanders out the window, down into the street to see what Manny and Chi Chi are up to. They're hustling a couple of girls and then meanders all the way back up and into the window. I mean, that is brilliant. While the exterior of the motel was on a Miami Beach location, the bathroom itself was built 2,700 miles away on an L.A. soundstage. In fact, there were two because they knew it would get messy. I said, you know, we're going to probably go through five gallons of blood. We're going to need another set. And he says, well, what do you mean? I said, we can't clean that blood up in time. You know, we're going to spend all day cleaning, so why don't we just build two sets? To achieve the visual impact, cinematographer John Alonzo had to get the details right. John Alonzo, he said, whatever you do, you got to make the chainsaw yellow. And I said, why? He goes, because nothing reads blood like yellow. Brian asked me, he said, can you get something to splatter in with blood? And I said, sure, you know, grab a paintbrush, put some pony blood in it. And I stood back and it was flipping blood on his face. It doesn't take much to let your imagination go when the blood starts hitting you in the face and, and Al Pacino is there wide-eyed and it was like trying to save my soul because my body was gone. <laughs> we actually did a lot more that didn't make the movie. I literally cut an artificial leg that was charged with blood with, at, at, a, at high pressure with a chainsaw. 
Howdy leg, huh? For De Palma, the early scene played a key role in the film. From carry to blowout to dress to kill, De Palma had never been afraid of a little blood. Brian likes blood. More blood, more blood. Remarkably, the violence is entirely in the viewer's mind. That scene is a horrifying scene. But if you watch it very closely, you never actually see the chainsaw touch flesh. A little bit of blood splattering and great, you know, expressions and acting from the actors sell it. To temper the horror, De Palma cut against the violence with the sly edge of his wit. The humor was a part of, of what I thought right from the start would be necessary. Otherwise, it would be too blunt and too hard to take, I think. Like the time Manny shows him his idea of how to pick up women. Ooh, look at that. Thing that look like a lizard, like a bug coming out of your mouth. He's always horny. In every scene, he's horny. Oliver wanted Manny to be a real contrast to Tony Montana's intensity and focus. He said, Steve, I want you to try this thing. Have you ever seen these like hustlers try to pick up women by sticking their tongue out? And he goes, because I saw this guy. It was the funniest thing I've ever seen. He tried to pick up this girl, and she just hauled off and slapped him. Oh, look at that. Hey! When it came time to shoot the scene, the young woman picked for the pickup was just a little too nice when it came to the slap. Aye. Well, we did 22 takes. Aye. Aye. 22 takes. By the end, I'm going, please, please, just concentrate. Just, just hit me. Just slap me. And she goes, but, but I don't want it to leave a mark. It's leaving a mark already anyway. <laughs> They're like putting makeup on me and stuff. And Brian is like, I think he's just doing it on purpose. He was just like, one more time, Steve. If you don't get her to slap you, we'll just cancel the scene. You know, <laughs> we'll just throw it out. Hey, oh, yo. You're sick. You see what happened to him? But despite the occasional flashes of humor, Universal executives weren't finding a whole lot to laugh at. As the weeks went on, they were getting increasingly worried. The curve, the arc of the experience of making Scarface was fraught with problems at virtually every turn. With all the takes and all the complicated shots, the film was getting further and further behind schedule. Is a very good director, but he's not a super professional, on top of it, totally organized director. Production on Scarface uh, began to uh, exceed its budget when uh, De Palma started slowing things down to make these kind of elaborate camera movements that he wanted. It was a schedule that was condensed to the point of, you know, silliness. There was no way we're gonna, we were gonna do that movie in 66 days. The movie was supposed to be a two-month shoot. It went on seven months. The budget grew. As the budget grew, the pressure on me from my boss at the studio, Mr. Wasserman, grew. There was a movement inside my company to fire Brian. And they're going like, why haven't you shut that thing down? Why don't you get rid of him? Why don't you get a real director? But despite all the pressures, De Palma wasn't letting up. He was still planning a grand finale that would push everyone, including the film star, right to the edge. And we heard this screaming, like agony, pain, screaming. And we thought, wow, he's really going for it there. But he was actually in pain and screaming. What are we going to do now? We're going to eat that salsa for breakfast. As the shoot moved into the spring of 1983, and the shooting schedule expanded from two months to six, there was plenty of pressure to go around, from the studio level on down. And yet somehow, the team just kept rolling. We never fired a director in the making of a picture. We did the best we could under the circumstances. And somehow, for all the tension and all the overages, De Palma and Pacino had found a real rhythm together, working in lockstep as the filming went on. By the time the grand finale rolled around, the cast and crew were firing on all cylinders, but this sequence would be the true test for the Scarface team. When production designer Ferdinando Scarfiati proudly took De Palma to see the stage for the first time, before the first frame was shot, the elaborate set almost burned down. And we walked on the stage, and as soon as the lights went on, a spark flew from one of the lights, hit a silk, and raining, dropping, fiery silk sta started falling all over this, you know, newly completed, never been shot, 
set, followed like in five minutes by the Universal Fire Department coming in with hoses, extinguishing the fire. So Nando's beautiful set within, you know, 15 minutes was like a wet mess. But the set would be rebuilt, more lavish than ever, and shooting on this extravagant scene would soon be underway as a coked up Tony Montana is attacked by a Bolivian hit squad. You can imagine how, with seven cameras, how long that sequence took to shoot with all the extras and, and this, the whole thing. It was uh, days and days. That scene alone, it took about two weeks to shoot. Every time you pull the trigger and shoot up the room, the effects guys redress the entire set while you'll sit there for maybe an hour and a half or two hours. The scene starts with Tony at a desk full of cocaine, an entire mountain of nose candy. Many have speculated exactly what substance was being snorted by Pacino. Everybody asked that, was that cocaine real? It's still a secret as to actually what the powder was. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't like to give away that secret because it takes away from somebody's belief. As the hit squad begins their assault, Tony Montana doesn't settle for a standard issue rifle. His little friend had to be something special. Say hello to my little friend! It's called an M203. It's an M16 with a grenade a launching attachment on it. Back in the 60s, you know, I guess they were using them in the military, but they were not released for the public at all. So only military at the time would know because Colt wouldn't even release pictures of it. To make it look more dramatic, Stunt coordinator Ken Pepio and Stan Parks had to invent a system that synced gun flashes to the camera frames. John uh, Orlanzo came to me and he said, Ken, we got a problem with the machine guns. If you have a camera that's running at 24 frames, there's gonna be a time when the shutter is actually closed, it's not open, and the gun's firing. So you won't pick that up. If they were out of phase, it wouldn't be on film. What we fell upon was taking a semi-automatic gun. We triggered the camera so that the camera was in phase with our device. It's the flashing that, that they needed to get. The gun was a mechanical marvel, but it claimed a very real casualty. The shells that were coming out of those guns were hot. Well, what happened with Al was he grabbed the, the end of the barrel, which was red hot because he had just fired a half a clip through it. And we heard this screaming, like agony, pain, screaming. And we thought, wow, he's really going for it there. We just all thought that he was uh, acting. And somebody yelled cut that was not Brian. There's a lot of people screaming and all that. Brian was fuming as to who's yelling cut on my set. It was just one of those sort of crazy, crazy moments. Al had fallen on it like palm on the barrel and got second and third degree burns on his hand. And he was actually in pain and screaming. Al had to go to the hospital. He couldn't film again for another two or three weeks. Waiting for Pacino to heal, they worked on the shots with the assassins. But the first hit squad didn't satisfy De Palma. They were pro stuntmen, but they were too Anglo. Brian goes, this isn't gonna work. These guys, I need Colombians. I need real, I need the real thing. Yeah, but the Colombians can't act. They can't, you know, he goes, I don't care. He goes, get me some Colombians. When the Colombians arrived on set, there was only a couple that spoke English. And most had never done this kind of work before. Normally, you know, a stunt guy is trained and they, they know what they're doing and they can get it done. Well, these guys had to run in with these guns and then Al's gonna kill him, right? He's, he's got his machine gun. He's just mowing him down. They're, you know, well, they, they run in and they'd have their gun, and they'd try and shoot their gun, and then you'd see them in camera going, you know, firing their hits off. Brian would go nuts. He goes, get that guy out of here. And they forget the performance. They forget to shoot the gun. With up to five cameras running in the massive shootout scene, De Palma needed a lot of help. To pull it off, he invited a special visitor. One day, Brian's friend Steven Spielberg came to the set and actually guest-directed one camera set up. And I remember it was kind of funny because now I have two directors on the set, two big directors at the set, and um, I was discussing something with Steven to make sure he was getting whatever he wanted and everything. And I look over and Brian's looking at me and he goes, hey, remember me? <laughs> I'm over here. He told uh, Spielberg, just do a shot, whatever you want. And Spielberg did a, a thing where he had one of the 
um, extras come right up to his camera lens and die in foreground. And I think that shot's in the movie. It was fun. It was fun. It was just one of those moments in film history, I guess, you know, to have the two of them on the set working together. It was a massive sequence in every way. The capper, the last shot, a bullet-ridden Tony Montana is finally taken out by Sosa's supreme assassin. I had to come up behind Tony Montana. Like, I'm this very silent kind of uh, angel of death, and then just, boom. <laughs> Brian just kept saying, no, Gino, slow down, slow down. I was barely moving, and, and he wanted it to be slower and slower and slower. I didn't understand why until I saw the film. The apocalyptic ending, like the larger film, was violent, bombastic, troubling, and yet blessed with a bit of genius. Tony ends face down, spread-eagled, Christ-like in the fountain. As the camera does a slow pullback, the stuntman holds his breath, and the globe gleams ironically. Elaborate camera work, larger-than-life performances, imagery bloody and epic, they all came together in this last sequence. And as the shoot came to an end, an exhausted team believed that all the fighting and tension had in fact paid off. That all the working and reworking had led to something greater than the sum of its parts. You know, at the end of the day, the making of any motion picture is a kind of elegant car wreck characterized by the sort of ultimate politics of compromise. Sometimes that kind of infighting creates a bad film that's just chaotic, and sometimes, somehow, it explodes into something. What was happening was a lot of electricity between a lot of talented people. But while these talented people felt they had made something special, they were about to learn that the critics had a much different opinion. We got killed. They went personal on, on Brian De Palma and on Oliver's screenplay and on, on Al Pacino. And they attacked him personally, like, how could you allow yourself to do something so grotesque? So say good night to the bad guy. The last time you're gonna see a bad guy like this again, let me tell you. After months of production challenges, Scarface moved into the edit room in the summer of 1983. And the editors found they had their hands full. With more than double the footage of a normal film, the editing schedule was very short, but there was a huge amount of footage coming in. Ryan covered it with several cameras from all different angles, and take after take after take. Now all that shooting would come home to roost. I think my initial pressure was, am I ever going to be able to do this? The editor's first plan was to cut a film that was fast and furious, but that style didn't work at all. This is a totally different type of film. The scenes played a lot better, a lot more powerful, if we just kept the pace very slow, certainly more slow than anything produced today. De Palma, adding even more material, decided to include documentary footage of the Marielle boat lift at the top to give the film a ripped from the headlines immediacy. I copied about 100 hours of actual news material from uh, the aftermath of all those people coming over, not only the boats and the landings, but the crime and the tent cities. As gritty and real as the story was, De Palma chose another direction when it came to music. High-gloss composer Giorgio Moroder, famed producer of disco hits like Donna Summer's I Feel Love and Love to Love You Baby, was brought in to do the score with his trademark synthesizers. This was the era of Studio 54 and uh, people, you know, doing cocaine in the bathroom. And so it, he kept that in mind with the kind of music that he wanted. First time I heard the music, I wondered whether it would work because it was a synthesized score. But it was absolutely right for the film. Tony Montana's totally false synthesized world that he'd created. And the music helped that. To many, Marauder's score summed up the era. To others, it was already old fashioned. Scarface captures the 1980s in a very specific way. Money is, is free-flowing, the gangster trade is flourishing, and you have Giorgio Moroder's soundtrack, which was you know very much of the disco era. How can you watch this film and listen to the score and not laugh? I mean, you know, it's hilarious. It's, it's so dated. 
but editing and music did come together, and the cuts started coming out of the edit room. That was when Universal and De Palma began to spar. Some execs thought it was too violent. It was gruesome, literally and figuratively. It was gruesome. Some felt it was too long. I argued with Brian that the picture could work better by losing 15 to 20 minutes. Some didn't know what to make of it at all. It was like an oh my God reaction. What do we have here? This is a different kind of movie exponentially on every level than anything we had ever, we had ever attempted. Then a cut was presented to the ratings board and the blood really hit the fan. My feeling when I first saw Scarface was, uh, oh my God, the violence combined with the language was just absolutely extraordinary. The MPAA board recommended an X rating for excessive and cumulative violence and for language. You, man. You. Remember, the movie has several deficits. One is that it uses the word in a way that's never been heard on American screens. What you think I have worm like you? Not once or twice, but four thousand times. I don't know how many times did they say. It was almost as though De Palma was just sticking it to the censor, saying, okay, let's see how many times I can say this before you give me an X. Don't be calling me no dishwasher. I'll kick your monkey ass over the You're not going to do that to nobody. Joan Collins, famous for Dynasty at the time, uh, came out of a screening and said, uh, there are over a hundred in this film. That's more than most people have in a lifetime. The studio and the filmmaker started to battle back, trying to get the X knocked down. We need to get the damn thing rated. We need an R. Bregman, in our first conversation, I remember very well, threatening me. He was going to drag me through the mud in the press, etc. In those days, no newspaper would run an ad for an X-rated picture. What are you going to say? You put a guy on a sandwich board on a street corner, Scarface opens tonight? There was a full press attack upon the board. I got calls from all over the place, from reporters, writers. The rating board is a kind of sacrosanct organization. You can't overrun them. You can't bully them into submission. All you can do is negotiate, 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 negotiate. But after two more revised submissions, after trims and cuts of language and bloodshed, they still had the X. You are all a bunch of ass in a last-ditch effort, Bregman called for a hearing and decided to treat the half-hour appeal like a full-day court case, bringing in witnesses to testify the movie was an important commentary on a major social issue, taken straight from real case files. They brought in journalists. There was the sheriff of Broward County who said this is a wonderful anti-drug film. It had all of... Uh, all of the propaganda before, all of the press before, all of those people who appeared. And I do believe that the fix was in, that the people who were there had economic interests in that film being an or. I think the vote was 17 to 3 to whomp us. Victory in hand, his appeal won. De Palma would end up undoing the trims and releasing the film in its original form. With the hard-won new R rating in place, Universal set out to sell Scarface, their big Christmas movie. But the studio was unsettled. They weren't sure exactly what they had or how it would do at the box office. And as the movie headed into its premieres, they had no idea how the film would be received. I think people went into Scarface expecting to see something a little more genteel. And what they got was 160 F-bombs, uh, a ton of blood and guts, and not a lot of redeeming messages. You know what a hasa is, Frank? That's a pig that don't fly straight. Neither do you, Frank. At the New York premiere, when I came out with my friends and family, there were not a lot of slaps on the back and, hey, well, that was a great film. People didn't really know what to make of it. The screening of the film in New York, the grand opening, was a horrible thing. Maybe like 40 minutes into it, 30, people are getting up and walking out. I remember sliding down in my seat because I was so embarrassed. It was so depressing. The Scarface screening for critics was chaos. There was a moment when you thought, wow, this is not going to get 
rave reviews. And it's the scene where Tony's sitting at the desk and there's a big pile of cocaine in front of him and his face just goes down into it. And he gets cocaine all over his face. And it's supposed to be this sort of serious moment and everybody in the theater burst into laughter. They were mocking it. The next day, the critics basically said that it was the worst film of all time. Oh God, we got destroyed. Wow. The media, the critics destroyed us. They went personal on, on Brian De Palma and, and on Oliver's the screenplay and on, on Al Pacino. And they attacked him personally, like how could you allow yourself to do something so, so grotesque? I thought for the first half of the film, it was an epic film. It was building up, and then it just kind of went insane. It just seemed to go so far over the top that it lost the narrative. I was reeling, like for days and days, and then for years. It was really like this movie should just be forgotten, and these artists will go get back to the drawing board and do something else. This was a grand mistake for everyone involved. It looked as if Scarface was doomed to a shallow grave, just like its hero. But as it turned out, that was just the start of the Scarface journey. I gotta tell you, nobody had this in mind. And if anyone says they, they did, they are making it up. Don't you think you I don't even want that! On December 9th, 1983, after all the drama, Scarface opened nationwide in 996 theaters. And the response was far from inspiring. It's got Al Pacino, it's got this classy pedigree, and then it just kind of flops. This is not exactly the typical Christmas movie. There's a tradition for Christmas, and it usually doesn't consist of, uh, you know, blood, guts, and mayhem. There's tremendous expectations for it. It brings in about $4 million, you know, in its first initial wave of release. Ending up 16th on the year's box office list, the film barely recouped its costs, at the box office level, Scarface never made a dime. The guys in my distribution company just beat the hell out of me for the underperformance of the movie. I was expecting that the sheer controversy would generate bigger grosses, and that just didn't happen. But then, something strange did. The movie began popping up at late night theaters, and the audience just kept coming. It was a movie that Hollywood did not create as a hit, but the audience did. It was one of the first sort of cult movies that was discovered by people where audiences of all kinds, kids, uh, blacks, whites, Latinos, would come and see that movie over and over again. It's like the, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. People see it and they'll sit there and they'll repeat all the lines. Say hello to my little friend. 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 And then a booming technology changed the fate of Scarface. A new audience discovered the film on videotape, who perhaps ignored it at the theaters. And over time, it made the film into a phenomenon almost exclusively because of its run uh, on videotape. The tapes started disappearing off the shelves. People would uh, record tapes and pass them around, sort of like video word of mouth, you know? This thing sold hundreds of thousands of VHS units, boom, and then continued to sell. By the mid 80s, the film started getting picked up by the hip hop generation. It had a big, big impact. What it is to be a hip hop artist is to want to be a boss. And Tony Montana, love him or hate him, he was a boss. Bottom line. It's a movie about rags to riches, you know? It's a movie about going from nowhere to somewhere. The American dream wasn't intended for us. So we took Tony Montana and made that into our version of the American dream. Hip-hop songs and videos were soon packed with Scarface references. Scarface became this touchstone for gangster culture. Every rapper in the world has their Scarface posters inside their house. 50 Cent posed for the cover of Vibe in an exact uh, reproduction of the Scarface poster. I did a Mariah Carey video, Heartbreaker, and Jay-Z was in the jacuzzi playing, of course, Tony Montana, and Mariah was playing Michelle Pfeiffer's role. Snoop Dogg saying that he'd seen the movie hundreds of times, and he did, he's saying that, you know, he watches the movie, you know, once a week. It's so common throughout hip-hop that you almost uh, can't be a rapper without at some point having paid proper respects to the altar of Scarface. 
Scarface became a kind of guidebook to ghetto life. Tony Montana becomes this kind of very odd moral compass uh, for what he represented. You had to be loyal, you had to be hard. Uh, you had to be somebody who didn't betray your friends. Oliver Stone's lines became the law of the street. Not just catchphrases, rules to live by. Who put this thing together? Me! Who do I trust? Me. That's who. All I got is my balls and my word. And I don't break them for no one. Do you know what the problem with the film is? I've become a role model for young hoodlums. These guys that come up to, to us and say, hey man, you guys are my hero. It's because of you guys I became a drug dealer. It's because of you I got shot five times. And what was supposed to say? Wow, we're proud? <laughs> the fascination took the filmmakers by surprise. They saw their movie as a cautionary tale of ambition and self-destruction. Now it was seen as a glorification of thug life. Unfortunate as that might be. It always surprised me a little bit and confused me that that entire culture embraced Tony Montana, even though his ending is horrific. Bregman and, and De Palma, they almost still to this day seem puzzled by that whole kind of street level acceptance of the movie. And they still had no real sense of why hip hop music uh, musicians and producers and young black actors uh, really saw this as a real touchstone. In a certain way, it was a movie that baffled its own creators. And it wasn't just street culture. A much wider audience began embracing Tony Montana. And the actors in the film found they were being treated with a brand new respect. I go to Home Depot or to Lowe's or anywhere, and the first thing I asked, did you see the movie Scarface? Yeah. Well, I'm the guy that had the arm sawed off. <laughs> Boom, man. You go to the front of the line. People just flip out. They go, oh my God, you're that guy that killed Scarface? Every other week I score with girls because of the movie. I've had people who recognize me in the subway. They say Mama Montana. And right then and there, they did the scene. Guys in the street, if they pass you by, throw the dialogue at you. Coming up to me, go, hey, Chichi, get the yayo. Chichi, Chichi, get the yayo. I don't want your money. I don't need your money. It comes down to one thing, only boys. Huh? Lesson number one, don't get high your own supply. Lesson number two, don't underestimate the other guy's greed. <laughs> And so it was the audience itself that changed the fate of Scarface. Taking it from being a sort of box office disappointment to making it into a cult classic demonstrates the power of audiences to give meaning to films that perhaps didn't exist in the first place. In a way, over the decades, the movie left its creators behind and went on to its own stardom. I gotta tell you, nobody had this in mind, you know? Um, and if anyone says they, they did, they are making it up. Today, Scarface has gone from a film to a cultural touchstone. References to it are everywhere, from South Park... You know what you are? You're a bunch of cockroaches. ...to The Sopranos. This is Scarface, final scene, bazookas under each arm. Say hello to my little friend. Before Scarface, you saw Mexico with a white suit, he was a waiter. You know, now he's a badass. When I was first talking to the companies who produce Breaking Bad, I told them that what I intended to do was to tell the story of a, of a Mr. Chips who transforms himself into a Scarface. Amazingly enough, even in Iraq, Saddam Hussein was a fan, hiding his money in a company he named the Montana Management Company. No wonder a marketing blitz has generated Scarface coasters, Scarface clothes, Scarface action figures, I brought my Scarface doll. It looks like something between Frankenstein and Tony Montana. Scarface, as a, as, a, as a brand itself, man, I see it all the time. I mean, I own a pair of boxers that has Scarface on them. Once you have underwear made out of your film, you fall into the cult category. I don't know if they make underwear out of, you know, It's a Wonderful Life. And the DVD releases have been pure gold, selling over 12 million copies to become Universal's top-selling DVD title of all time. Even the critics were eventually won over, as Scarface was placed on AFI's list of top 10 gangster films of all time. When I first saw the movie, I thought that it was the movie Brian set out to make, and I, and I thought he achieved it. I was pleased. Its creators continue to thrive. 
Al Pacino won a Best Actor Oscar for Sin of a Woman. He remains a superstar of stage and screen. Michelle Pfeiffer has gone on to be nominated for Best Acting Oscars on three separate occasions. Oliver Stone has become the acclaimed director of such films as Wall Street and JFK, winning directing Oscars for Platoon and Born on the Fourth of July. And Brian De Palma teamed up in 1993 with Pacino again to film a second crime movie, Carlito's Way. He continues to direct blockbusters, from The Untouchables to Mission Impossible. And today, the movie and all the performances are as popular as ever. Al's performance is so bravura and in places way over the top. I find him to be like a fine wine. The older he gets, the more delicious his performance is. That guy's just going into the darkest place you can imagine, so I think everybody loves to see that. That's probably why it holds up. Scarface is running 24-7 somewhere. My great-grandchildren will be getting the residuals. It's a true classic. The movie just sort of seems to have this life of its own. When you think of great movies, you, you don't see a lot of people walking down the street quoting last year Marienbad or uh, Rules of the Game. No, they're quoting Scarface. And that's why people are still watching it 30 years later. Well, you can't get rid of it, you know? It grabs you by the throat. It comes at you in such bursts. It's the movie that won't die. Scarface is a mother That's what it is. And so a film that looked destined to implode, shot down just like its hero. Yet somehow, year after year, it keeps coming, keeps taking the hits, like Tony himself. <laughs> Unstoppable, indestructible, going out in a blaze of glory.